Welcome everybody. I'm so glad you could come to attend a lecture by my very good friend and colleague, Madeline O'Day. I'm Julie Seagraves, the Executive Director of the Asian Art Coordinating Council, and we helped in conjunction with the uh, Center for Asian Studies to bring Madeline here today to give a fabulous and very interesting talk on her wonderful book. I've known Madeline since 1996, and I think with all friends who do outstanding work, you forget all of the particulars that they've done in their life, you just know them as a person that you like and care for. So I'm going to have to read off some of these achievements because uh, they, it, she's had so many, uh, I'm going to make sure I cover them all. Uh, she's been on chi in China early, uh, in 1986 she arrived, but uh, I first met her in 1996 and she's been a journalist and a writer. Uh, and has covered the political, economic, and cultural scene in China since that time. So for really pretty much the past three decades. Um, and when she first went to Beijing in 1986, she was a correspondent for the Australian Financial Review uh, News. And she really was at a seminal time period in China at that point. Um, the beginnings of, of contemporary Chinese art as we know it was just really beginning and she had a wonderful entree into various uh, uh, levels of artists uh, and their lives and their works. Um, she also continued to cover China throughout the 1990s and she was a producer with ABC television in Australia. In 2004 she, she moved back to China uh, to live and she was in a position at that point she uh, uh, worked with China uh, Radio International, and later was the arts editor of the Beijinger, which any of you have gone to Beijing, you, you all know, very familiar with Beijinger. And she was the founding editor, editor of um, uh, an arts correspondent uh, and, uh, for uh, Arts Info, and uh, also wrote for Art and Auction, Modern Painters, um, let's see, who else? So many, Guardian. <laughs> orientations, Leap magazines, and a, a wide variety of different other publications. I think the interesting thing about Madeline is that she is able to fuse in this book uh, many of the political concerns that were happening in China and uh, mirror them with uh, certain, the artists that she selected. Um, as all of us who know, who covered contemporary Chinese art, realize that politics are an essential element of their artwork usually reacting against it in terms of Chinese politics. Uh, but it, it's very different than the Western concept of, of creating art. And Madeline's going to take you on a brief journey through this very significant time period uh, to explain the evolution of Chinese politics and also how the artists reacted to it. So please, my friend and uh, a wonderful uh, author, Madeline O'Day. Uh, thank you, Julie, for that really warm introduction. I know what you mean about um, when you've known people for a long time, you often don't know the basic things in their CV, so you did a brilliant job of uh, researching that. And so today, yeah, I'm going to take you, as she says, a kind of journey through the book, but I'm not going to obviously talk about everything in it because the book. Um, spans from the end of the Cultural Revolution to today, so obviously I'm not going to you know, take you through the whole tour, but I'm hopefully give you a bit of an idea of, uh, of what the book's about. So, as Julie said, my story with China began in um, 1986, um, in January, when I arrived in Beijing as the uh, correspondent for the Australian Financial Review newspaper. Um, I was a young reporter at the time um, and quite green, but I was um, assigned to do what it was a very big story at the time, uh, the big economic story in China. This was how China was revolutionising its economy, um, the growth of free enterprise, the smashing of the so-called iron rice bowl, um, of assigned jobs and, and a home for life. And what I came to see as a kind of supercharged Chinese version of the Industrial Revolution that was taking place in China from 1978 um, uh, over the next uh, decades and would, was set to, and you could see that already in 1986, but certainly we see it today, that it would change the lives and the landscapes of millions, hundreds of millions of, of Chinese. 
So that story, this big economic story for the Financial Review that I was covering, um, saw me haunting the offices during the daytime, the haunting the offices of um, Western businessmen, um, taking uh, trips to look at joint ventures in the special economic zones, um, inspecting factories and so on, and also attending the weekly um, briefings at the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which were um, interminable and never told us anything, but if we didn't turn up, it was like bad school children, we would be no noticed we weren't there, so we had to go. So. At the time, as I say, this was my kind of day job, that's what I was doing in the daytime, but I could tell as soon as I arrived there was a, another story going on in China, kind of underneath the surface, and it, at first I, I thought of it as kind of a, a diversion from my day job, um, but very quickly I realised that what was actually going on in what I recognise as Beijing's emerging Bohemia was in many ways as important as the big story I was covering. Um, Something really big was happening within this emerging avant-garde in Beijing, where I lived. And this is an avant-garde that comprises you know, intellectuals, young and old, teachers, writers, students, and, and artists as well. All of these people had endured years of, sort of intellectual starvation, in a sense, during the Cultural Revolution, whatever age they were at. And they were just desperate, thirsting for interchange, information, discussion, and, and, and to participate in their own society. Um, so I arrive in the middle of the 1980s, and that's the kind of atmosphere. So one of the main loci of Beijing's Bohemia at the time was a place called the Friendship Hotel, which I think was probably where I met Julie for the first time. Um, people who know Beijing will know that uh, it is out in the capital's western suburbs, very neatly um, uh, near to the university quarter. And at the time, it was where China liked to house what they called their foreign experts. So foreign experts were the people that um, China um, believed to have the skills um, that could bring the Western know-how that they wanted to China. So these were teachers and technicians and translators and the like. Um, China believed they needed this uh, Western know-how desperately. Um, and so these foreign experts were brought to China and were housed in this Friendship Hotel, um, which was quite a glamorous location, in fact. Um, rather spacious and beautiful. And for the first year in China, that I was living in China, I actually lived at the Friendship Hotel, which was a lucky thing. And so I'm going to make a few readings from my book this evening because I think it gives you more of an idea of, um, of the atmosphere rather than me just talking. Um, so it was at the Friendship Hotel that I had that first encounter of my life with, um, with a Chinese artist you know, that I can recall. Um, and I'm going to give you a reading now from sort of early, the first chapter of my book, early pages of the book, where I describe um, that meeting, um, which obviously was important, but I've also selected it to read because I think it gives you more um, of the atmosphere of Beijing that I've been trying to capture in these opening remarks. I think the book gives a better, a better idea, so I will read from that now. Okay, so we were at the halfway mark of a decade that would take us from the dawn of open China to the tragedy of Tiananmen Square in 1989. But at that moment, no one knew where the limits would be or where this heady road was taking us. On that Saturday at the Friendship Hotel, it was his girlfriend that I noticed first. She caught my eye with an abbreviated striptease that took her from an army greatcoat to a skinny black ski suit and on to a mini dress in just two fluid movements. She wore the only kinds of stockings available in China back then. Those are the ones that stopped, disappointingly, at the knee. But the black stiletto she took out of her handbag made up for that. Her boyfriend wore his bag with the strap diagonally across his body and held tightly to his side. <coughs> he was carrying something more precious to him than a change of shoes. It was a collection of photographic slides. He was a painter, and these were images of his work. This was how I got to see Chinese contemporary art for the first time, on transparencies drawn one by one from a battered plastic sleeve and held up to a dim ceiling light in the Friendship Hotel. As I prepared to look, I could see dozens, around the room I could see dozens of strange groupings. People were discussing Freud's interpretations of dreams and Bob Dylan Astro Boy and Kurosawa, Misty Poetry, and the banned ideas of a Taiwanese writer called Boyan, 
who had just skewered what he called the ugly Chinaman. You could see the young diplomat falling for the aspiring punk rocker, the Californian gym instructor captivating the seemingly stitched up Carter from the think tank, the poet looking on indulgently as his wife schemed her escape to the West with a foreign expert she'd only just met. She could see the scholar gratefully slipping into his bag a still banned book about Western economics. You could see how the ground was shifting under Chinese society, how changes were beginning to play out that the country's leaders had never planned for and might not be able to control no matter how desperately they tried. So I will go now to my first slide, which I will do by doing this, hopefully. Yes. OK. But of course, the story of Chinese contemporary art does not begin with me in 1986, um, at this meeting at the Friendship Hotel. Um, the roots of, of Chinese contemporary art and the avant-garde stretch back um, to the Cultural Revolution and to the cohort of youngsters who were sent to the countryside um, during those years. As you all know, Cultural Revolution, 1966 uh, to 76. Um, the period from 1978 to the end of the decade uh, were momentous ones in the history of modern China. And conventional accounts will rightly point to the changes that came from the top, notably Deng Xiaoping's decisions to open up the Chinese economy. But there were powerful forces rising from below as well, powerful forces for change, and that's the story I want to talk about today. So this slide you see here portrays a historic event that today in China is not remembered at all, certainly not in any history book, but it was a historical event. And I will come to it in a moment and I'll explain what we're seeing in this slide. But if you look at the man in the middle, if you can see this guy here, this guy at this moment in history, he's actually making history for the third time um, in his life. And in fact, he's making history for the third time in less than a year. So let me talk about the first of the history-making events that uh, Huang Rei, the man you see at the centre of the slide, uh, was involved in. So in the late 1970s, um, in the wake of the Cultural Revolution, um, there was a great push for change, as I said, not just from the top, um, from behind the red walls of uh, Jungnan High, but also from below. There was a great force for change coming from the cities, of course, where these youths were coming back from the, from the from their rustification in the countryside, coming back to the cities, but also, and very importantly, great uh, push for change from the countryside, where at that time more than 60% of the population lived. So in late 1978, Deng Xiaoping secured the agreement of his colleagues in the Communist Party to his plan for opening up and reform. And this was a decision that was, was born of dire necessity. Um, in 1978, after the serial disasters of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, China's economy was in ruins. In the countryside, peasants were already taking their matters, matters in their own hands. Um, in the rural provinces of Anhui and Sichuan, farmers were turning their backs on the communes and starting to farm the land again for themselves. When Deng was arguing with his cohort for his, um, his great scheme of opening up and reform, he pointed to these experiments that were going on in the countryside, these brave farmers who had already proved what his reforms could achieve. They proved it by, as I say, turning their back on the communes, starting to farm land again for themselves, and shown that immediately the farms were much more productive. But at the same time, there was a big change in the cities as well. As Deng Xiaoping was manoeuvring for control at the end of 1978, Thousands of young people, like the people in this photograph, as well as crowds of ordinary Beijingers, were gathering in the streets near Forbidden City, in Zhongnan High, in Tiananmen Square, and they were posting their ideas, their petitions, their thoughts, their poetry, their sketches, on a stretch of wall that would be known, become to be known as Democracy Wall. In China at the time, of course, there was no free press, no talkback radio, no internet, of course, and in fact, no way for ordinary people to exchange ideas in public at all. And the wall became this place. It was, in effect, a giant social media site um, in a time without computers. And it was that wall, Huang Rei and his friends, the poets Meng Ke and Bei Dao, 
sold the first edition of their painstakingly produced literary journal today, Jintian, in December 1978. Exactly the same time as Deng Xiaoping was convincing his colleagues to sign on for his proposal, they were selling their literary journal. This was the first of Huang Rei's trifecta of history-making acts because Jintian was the first independent literary journal ever to be published in the PRC. It was independent because it was unapproved by designated authorities. So that was his first historic event. Then, on the 27th of September, 1979, that's about 38 years to the day from today, came his second historic moment. That's when the people you see in this picture in the front row held what is accepted to be the first ever exhibition of Chinese contemporary art ever to be held um, in the People's Republic of China, so the first since 1949. So, and what they did, it was a guerrilla show. It was not an authorised show. What they did was they, they just staged their exhibition um, outside, out of doors, on the railings, rather cheekily, on the railings of the National Art Museum of China. They chose themselves a name. They called themselves the Stars. And with their exhibition, their guerrilla exhibition, they made history. And that's considered to be the start, rightly considered to be the start of the Chinese contemporary art movement. Then, in the space of a week, they're making history again. And that's in the moment you hear in this, you see in this slide. So their guerrilla art show was a huge success. Um, Beijing, small place at the time, it was very quick that an enthusiastic crowd of Beijingers came to look at the exhibition. By the end of the first day, there were thousands of people flocking, looking at the pictures and the sculptures and the things that were there, very excited. And also um, older members of the, um, the Chinese art community, which included um, artists who had only just come back, having been sent away during the Cultural Revolution. They were just back in Beijing as well. They came down to people in their 60s and 70s and admired and appreciated the art, applauded the chutzpah, or chutzpah, I should say, chutzpah of this group of young men who had, and they were mostly men, there was one woman, um, who uh, launched this show. But two days later, they launched it on the 27th of September. On the 29th of September, Huang Rei arrived in the morning um, to sort of, you know, start the show for that day. And he found that all the posters that advertised the show were turned, uh, torn down and the works had all been impounded. Apparently 100 uh, members of the Public Security Bureau had come that morning early and taken away all the works. Not only that, they put up a notice saying that the, um, they'd taken them because the exhibition was illegal and so they had a right to take the works. So they could have at that point decided that they'd had a pretty good run. He'd had three history-making events in his life, uh, two, sorry, at this point. They could have decided at that point to say, well, we had an exhibition for two days, it was amazing, and now we'll go quietly. But they decided not to go quietly. And they said, we've got a new constitution in China. It's only just been inaugurated. And it says we have freedom of, ex freedom of speech, freedom of expression. We have these rights. The police have made a mistake in saying our uh, exhibition is illegal. We have the right to hold it. And so they held a march, and people who can read Chinese will have known this all along. It's a march in defense of the constitution. So they marched through the streets of Beijing. It was October the 1st, 1979. So it's the 30th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. So a very important date. And it, on that date, they were staging the first ever demonstration for freedom of speech ever held in the People's Republic. So that was his third history-making event. So on that day, when they took to the rain, this rainy day in Beijing, they take to the streets, they're taking an immense risk to do this to raise this banner, to, to make this demonstration. They know what can happen, how badly things can go politically in China. The Cultural Revolution is just a few years behind them. But yet, they marched, and their friends, they had many friends who marched with them who were not artists, but were members of the kind of community around Democracy Wall, people who were producing um, literature there, independent journals themselves. And as they marched, a thousand ordinary Beijing citizens fell in behind them and marched with them too. So it's really quite a remarkable thing. And as I say, a kind of history-making event. And even though today there's no official history that would record this event, it inspired people, obviously the people who were there that day, but it inspired people far beyond that day and in different parts of China because it was known that this had happened. And years later, there was a young man who was a student in quite a distant place in China at the time, in the, in the northeast of China,
and he wrote about how the news of this demonstration had inspired him. And the name of that young man was Liu Xiaobo. Most of you would have heard of him, the Nobel Peace Laureate um, who died recently, in, still in custody in China. He wrote an article 30 years after this event, and he drew a direct line between this demonstration and his actions with Charter 08, which was his famous petition with his friends calling for, in 2008, calling for democratic reform in China. He saw a direct line between this demonstration and his own action. It inspired him. He also pointed to the Chinese constitution and, and pointed out that the Chinese constitution provided freedoms which were not being respected by the leadership, in the same way as they pointed out the police had not respected theirs. But of course, within a year of writing that essay where he talked about this demonstration, he was um, under arrest and, and in 2010, of course, uh, by the end of um, 2009, he was, um, had been uh, sentenced to 11 years for subversion of state power. 2010, he became the only Chinese citizens, citizen to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to this date. And as you know, he died from liver cancer in July this year, still in custody. But the interesting thing about that is that's a pretty sort of, you know, dolorous and serious way of looking at it. But it wasn't just the protest that inspired him. He also wrote a lot of other lovely essays um, about the inspiration he took from this period of time. And people often would ask him, because he became such a famous kind of dissident, uh, post Tiananmen Square, they would say to him, you know, what was it that really influenced you in your formative years? And, he, and they would think, oh, was it Deng Xiaoping's reforms? What was it? And he would say, no, the things that inspired me most in those years was the poetry of Meng Ke and Beidao and the art of Huang Rei. So if you're looking at a generation here that's thirsting for change, these people who want to be artists, people like Liu Xiaobo, still in the countryside, still a student, dreaming of a kind of different kind of China. This is a group that's seen their teenage years completely upended by the Cultural Revolution. Um, they had a chance to, to go into the countryside and see the reality of their countryside. But their coming of age, they're still young at the time when Deng Xiaoping has taken control. So they've got a chance to really make their way in the world as well. So I'm going to leave that generation. There's so many things you could talk about that generation. They're really fascinating and I think not so well known in the contemporary art story actually. But because you've got limited time and I want you to be able to ask questions and discuss this, I'm going to move on to the generation that comes later, just a little later. And these are people who, who where the 80s was their kind of playground. They were the people who, who got the chance to go to university um, in the late 70s and early 1980s as young people. They were not, had not been sent away during the Cultural Revolution. They graduated in the late 70s and so on and got the chance to go to university in the 80s. And the 80s, it's not just because I was there then, um, I believe it to be the freest decade that you can um, isolate in the Chinese contemporary heart story. If you think of it starting in 1978 and ending in uh, today, um, it's the freest decade for contemporary art and in some ways the freest decade for the society as a whole. Because it's a time when people really don't know where the limits are going to be. There's a sense that things are just opening up before them and there's all these new influences coming in from the West and possibility of new opportunities and they're going to be able to embrace them. There's that kind of feeling in the air. Um, and around China, the opening up and reform that, that Deng Xiaoping uh, inaugurated provided opportunities, not just for urban teenagers who benefited from the fact that he reopened the universities and really devoted you know, energy to the education system, making it you know, a real education system. Not just the urban teenagers, but also people from the countryside, like the guy who painted this painting many years later, who came from a very poor region of China called Guizhou, which is right down south of China. And he's the second, a second major character in my book. Huang Rei is the first, Guo Jian is the second. Um, he came to Beijing in 1985. Um, he came as a mature age student. He was 23 because he'd spent some time in the army previously. He was just out of the army when he came to Beijing. And I'm going to have another reading now, which will take up his story as he arrives in Beijing. Um, and uh, just a few weeks after he arrives at university, he goes to his first party. So this will give you an idea that it's not just me going to a party that changes my life. It can happen to other people too, in this case, Guo Zhen. So Guo Zhen hesitated at the door of a darkened studio. It was early, early autumn, 1985. He'd been given his invitation to his first um, university party. He hesitated at the door, but then, 
he eased it open. And as he eased it open, it seemed at first that the room was totally dark. There was music playing, and in the distance, a small red light was glowing. As his eyes adjusted to the dark, he saw people dancing, smoking, lying on the floor. This was alarming. Just a year ago, he'd been painting propaganda posters for the troops about the anti-spiritual pollution campaign. Even in remote Guizhou, this campaign had seen scores of young people imprisoned and some even executed for activities just like those going on in this room. Guo Jian started to back out of the room. But someone pulled him back. Don't worry, they said. We're all artists here. If this was meant to reassure him, it wasn't working. Then a group of girls started dragging him towards the dance floor. He thought, I'm older. I've been told I'm meant to be a class leader. And his teachers had told him, you're meant to be serious. But the girls seemed to know that he really wasn't that kind of serious guy. And he realized he knew it too. He wasn't that kind of guy. It was the first night he ever heard Western music and the first time he danced to it. The first time he drank Agorto, which was Beijing's favorite party rocket fuel. And it was the first time he tasted Western red wine, which they shared out of a single cup, which they passed from hand to hand as they rolled cigarettes in scraps of newspaper. Even today, the sound of Western music brings back to him the taste of printer's ink, tobacco, and red wine, the sorghum reek of Agorto, and the scent of the single brand of shampoo that all the girls used to use in those days. Later, Guo Jian couldn't remember exactly what music he heard that night, but every song was new. In those years, the West came to China on cassette tapes, mixed by foreigners before they left home and copied for their new Chinese friends when they arrived in China. Homesickness had weighted these collections towards the iconic, towards the anthems and the classics, and so in the soundscape of mid-80s China, sounds of silence mixed with Hotel California, life during wartime with brown sugar, and beat it with Like a Rolling Stone and Je Tam Mono Plu. The history of Western rock and pop became a soundtrack for Beijing's summer of love, romantic, elusive, sexy, poetic, and subversive. Even today, drunken reunions in China can erupt late into the evening into slurred renditions of John Denver's Take Me Home Country Roads, while Sounds of Silence plays on a continuous loop for ice skaters on the forbidden city's frozen moat. That night, Guo Jian stepped inside the underground culture that would be his true university for the next four years. From then on, he committed to a helter-skelter journey of discovery ignoring the course laid down for him by his elders, following connections where they led, looking for new worlds in art and literature and in life. And around the country, hundreds of thousands of other young people would do the same. So you get the sense of the excitement and so on. But also, there's an undercurrent. Even by this time, there's an undercurrent too. It is an exciting time. You know, I know I was there too. Modernism, Western modernism is coming into China in a rush. Sometimes one felt like a teenager being in China at the time, the sense that everything was new and fresh, that you'd be up late talking to people like Guo Jian, who I met at that time, talking about Freud, talking about T.S. Eliot, talking about Dali and Warhol, as if they were all just new to me as well. So it was a very exciting time. But there was an incredible undercurrent too that was building underneath the surface. It was an undercurrent of, of angst and frustration. Because at the same time as young people like Guo Jian were getting a chance to discover all sorts of new things and to discuss all sorts of incredible new ideas, they also knew that on graduation, they were going to be sent to assigned jobs. And their chances of really participating in society in a meaningful way was not yet there. Tomorrow didn't really belong to them. It still belonged to the people who were running the joint from inside uh, Jung Nan High, the, the leadership compound. And so it was no coincidence that in 1986, um, the first ever rock hit um, in China was a song by a, a musician called Sui Jian that really expressed this kind of angst and frustration. It was called Nothing to My Name. And that's really the anthem of this generation. So two years after Guo Jian went to his first party in 1985, students would actually be demonstrating around the country in what was a precursor to the Tiananmen demonstrations. 
Um, they, they're often forgotten now because Tiananmen, of course, is such a bigger event, but they were important for the time. They happened in, around the country in Hefei, Shanghai, Beijing. Students took to the streets to demonstrate their lack of um, agency. They were trying to change small things at university and they were not being allowed to do it. And their demonstrations, which peaked around New Year of 1987, actually led to the fall of the popular reformist leader at the time, General Secretary Hu Yaobang. And of course, it was the death of Hu Yaobang four years after the party, 1989, April, that would provide the trigger for students to come to Tiananmen Square in the spring of 89, setting off the extraordinary events at Tiananmen Square. So my plan now is to just read a thing about 1989 and then open to questions, because I think we need to have time to have some discussion. So as I probably hinted previously, 1989 is really the hinge year of Chinese contemporary history. It's a pivotal moment. In a way, you can see, you can look at all the events from 1978 to 1989, the sense that things are rushing towards that denouement. And then afterwards, nothing is the same. Um, the Tiananmen year, 1989, of course, it's the heart of my book as well. Um, and I won't talk about it more now, but I will say that it was an extraordinarily wrenching moment, not just for young people like Guo Jian, who joined the hunger strike in the square in the dying days of the protests, but for millions of people around the country who joined the protests during those heady days, because it wasn't just Beijing, it was Shanghai and Chengdu, um, almost every city, I think there was even in Xinjiang, there were in Tibet, there were demonstrations. Many people joined, not just students, lots of ordinary people. And it lives on in the memory of millions of people around the country today, despite all official efforts to erase it. And the official efforts to erase the memory are substantial. So, and remember for a moment that a million people rallied in one day in, in Tiananmen Square um, during these weeks leading up to the crackdown of June 3 and 4. Uh, one million in one day, and that was one million after the regime had declared martial law. So you can imagine the bravery and the persistence that, and the energy and the emotion, enthusiasm that led to that. So I'm going to read this short description of what it felt like for Guo Jian, the person who painted this painting, the person who just went to the party a few years previously, what it felt like to him on the night of June 3, when the army started to enter the city, the start of the military crackdown. On the night of June 3, Guo Jian was in the square when the word came. People came, ran people came running in, shouting, they're shooting, they're shooting, but in the square it was still quiet. He decided to head west to see for himself. He pedalled fast down the avenue of eternal peace with a classmate by his side towards the western suburbs and the major intersection of Mushi D. Surely they were firing rubber bullets, he thought. The army wouldn't shoot at Chinese citizens. As Guo Jian rode nearer to Mushi D with his classmate, he could hear the sound of gunfire, but he still tried to convince himself that it sounded like fireworks. He couldn't believe they'd be using live ammunition. But as they got nearer, he began to see the dead and the wounded by the side of the road, and he knew, this is real now. They rode up beside the Fuxing Hospital, and from there, Guo Jian could see smoke from the burning roadblock at Mushi D. Armoured trucks and tanks were rolling towards them out of the haze. He watched in horror as soldiers fired directly into the crowd. They weren't firing wildly, they were taking aim, firing, manoeuvring, then firing again. It was exactly like when he was in the army. They were firing, manoeuvring, then firing again. Exactly like he'd been trained to in the army, so I repeated that. These men were firing as they'd been trained to do in battle. Guo Jian and his classmate ran down into the entrance of the hospital and found the foyer awash with blood. The wounded from Mushi D and beyond were being brought to the hospital in a constant stream, on the backs of pedal carts, on bicycles, on anything that could serve as a stretcher. Beside the entrance where bicycles were normally parked, bodies lay in a pile. Guo Jian longed to do something heroic, but he felt paralysed. He sat down on a chair inside the door with his classmates slumped beside him. And then a doctor came out and said, we need help, come with me and he took them into a room where he told me later they almost slipped in the blood. There was so much blood, I couldn't look at it, and so I just looked at the doctor, he told me. The doctor said he needed someone to take out the dead bodies to create space 
for the wounded coming in. But I just couldn't do it. I walked out. It was too much for me. I thought, I don't want to be a man. And I sat down again, feeling so guilty. Then I heard someone say they needed people to carry in wounded from the street. And I thought, I can do that. The wounded were lying where they'd been shot. The army was still passing by. Guo Jen and the other volunteers waved white cloths as they went to lift the first person from the road. We carried the first guy back to the hospital. His blood was running out like water. He was alive then, but I don't know if he survived. Then we went out to collect the next person. But this time the soldiers started shooting. We scattered, but one of us was shot. After that, we knew there was nothing more that we could do. So, in a way, that moment is, is another, is also not just a pivotal moment in Chinese contemporary history, obviously, but also a pivotal moment in terms of the history of Chinese contemporary art. Because it's after this moment, there are many of the artists who, who kind of came of age and went to university during the 80s in this time of sense of expansion and excitement. Um, it was in the 90s they started to do their great work, and it was in reaction to the events in, of 1989. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flick through a few slides to give you some idea of some of the work that came straight out of the back of 89 um, in the early 1990s and then give you a little taste of what's happening now but I really won't have time for questions so, and discussion so I won't linger too much. Um, so the bloody end of these demonstrations did something really deep to the culture of China. Imagine how the experience I've just recounted of Gu Jens on that night Imagine that replicated amongst hundreds of thousands of people. If you think of the million people in Beijing who demonstrated, many of those people would have known people who were injured on that night. They would have witnessed terrible events as Guo Zhen did. Imagine that magnified, of course, um, across the whole of, the whole of China as well. Imagine what that does to a people, especially when uh, immediately after the event, a huge state-sponsored amnesia settles across the country. Um, it's expected to fall across the country. People are meant to forget. There's an official account of events and it's in stark contrast to what people experienced during those weeks. It's a, there's a counter-revolutionary rebellion put down by brave soldiers, some loss of life but minimal, and we should forget it. Forget it. It's a bad, it's a bad thing. So after June 4, there's a kind of sense of despair that seems to settle across the culture and a sense of hopelessness, and finally a kind of cynicism, which I think still runs through the culture today like a scar. And that's what this, paint, this work is all about. This is a photograph. This is not Photoshop. The missing finger of the left hand is indeed missing. It's a work of an artist called Shang Chi, who also joined the demonstrations in, uh, in the spring of 1989. And, but he didn't create this work until the end of the decade, end of the 90s. So in 1999, he created this work. And what it records is his own moment of despair. He sees this as a kind of self-portrait of himself, but also of his generation, a portrait of innocence and experience, in a sense. And what it records is a terrible event. After June 4th, he, he was not in Beijing on June 4th. His parents persuaded him he came from Hefei to come home before the crackdown. They could sense it coming and got him to come home. So he returned to Beijing some weeks after the event and to a city which was just so different from the one he'd left with great excitement just some weeks prior. And he just couldn't settle. He was meant to go back to university. He couldn't settle. He was in despair. And one day in a moment of complete despair, he kept thinking, how do I break with the past? How do I express how I feel? At that time, he was a performance artist. He was one of the first performance artists ever in China. How do I express my feelings? And one day, in a kind of fit of complete madness, really, he severed the finger of his left hand with a cleaver in the kitchen of the place that he was staying. A moment of complete madness. So, but for then, not very long after that, he actually, he leaves China, he goes abroad like a lot of young people at the time. They take the opportunity. Passports are being offered by all sorts of countries around the world in the wake of Tiananmen, and he goes away. It's only 10 years later he starts to make work about this moment in his life, and he makes this work, My Left Hand Me. So you have the hand, which expresses so much the kind of the moment of 89, the severing of the past and the future moment there. And in the palm of the hand, the, the portrait of himself as an innocent young boy, 
when he was just looking to the future. At the time when he, re he recollected to me later that he dreamt of what, growing up and becoming a soldier. So, yeah, it, I think expresses the disillusionment very well. One just final thing I'll say about 89 before I show you a couple of other pictures is that one thing that's very interesting, people who, who spent time in China will know this, that people in China talk about before and after 89 in the same way, in a very casual way of conversation all the time. You know, before June 4th, after June 4th. They talk about it in the way that I imagine way back at the start of the 20th century, people would talk about this before the Great War, you know, 1914, 18 war and after. People talk about that, you see that in history. Everything was different after the Great War. It's a bit like that with Tiananmen. People talk about it. They talk about before and after, and artists do. They talk about the work they could do before and the work they could do after. So I'm just going to show you some other works that came out of that period, and uh, they won't be able to um, let you um, have a say. So um, I picked, I've only picked three images to show you, um, and they're all from the same period, and they reflect some of the tendencies that came after 89. Um, there was a very important show exhibition that was curated by a Hong Kong curator and a mainland Chinese curator in the early 1990s, which they sent out around the world with the intention of showing what was going on in, the Ch in Chinese culture, you know, what was happening in the souls of Chinese artists. And they chose to show work by artists they already knew from before 89, artists they'd worked with, but they were showing the work they created post-89. The show was called post-89, Chinese art post-89. And they came up with what they thought were three moods of China post-89. And the first one they identified was embodied by this slide. It's called cynical realism in their definition. And what it sums up is this kind of cynicism I talked about before, a sense that after 89, there's no point. We may as well drop out. We're, not, we're obviously not going to get any kind of say in our society. We may as well just enjoy ourselves. And so Fung Li Jun's image, this Fung Li Jun painter image, of the yawning youth becomes a kind of defining image of this kind of tendency. Just, let's just forget, let's forget idealism, let's just be cynical about things. That actually ended up on the cover of Time magazine, as I understand it. Then the second tendency they, they saw in culture was materialism, rising materialism, because post-89, of course, um, there was kind of a grand bargain struck between the Chinese regime and the people, unspoken, but it's the same bargain that persists today. The bargain is the government will do everything they can do to make the living standards of Chinese increase exponentially year on year. People will become richer and richer and richer. And in exchange, the people will deliver to the regime the right to rule, and they won't interfere too much with that. That's the grand bargain. And so materialism is a big, big thing in the 1990s. You really feel it from very early in the 1990s. And this work by Wang Guangyi expresses that materialistic thing. These curators call this political pop. You could call it anything you like, really. But as you can see, um, it's based on a traditional Chinese um, woodcut, a socialist realist kind of image, which would normally show your worker peasant and soldier holding maybe a, a hammer, a sickle, the little red book. But in this case, they're holding a Mont Blanc pan and they're writing out Coca-Cola. So you can see the kind of critique of materialism, um, the lack of the loss of ideology and idealism. And the third tendency was this thing they called the wounded romantic spirit. And this is the kind of work that, as in this work by Zhang Xiaogang, tries to express some of the sadness and the sense of mourning that settled over China post-89 and the way in which it fed into other national traumas, like the Cultural Revolution, and all the kinds of events that had happened in people's living memories that they could see being repeated over and over. After the Cultural Revolution, there was a sense that everything was just going to get better and better, and Tiananmen put a sort of full stop. OK, things are not... This is a full stop, and we're going to move on. And it's a terrible full stop. He creates this beautiful family portrait. This is one of a series called Bloodlines, a very famous series in Chinese contemporary art. You've probably seen this image before. And in it, he tries, as I say, to express this kind of sense of mourning. It's based on a family portrait from the Cultural Revolution, so they're, they're in the kind of... Um, the, the kind of Chinese communist uniform, in a sense, of the time. But he's trying to express in their eyes a sense of mourning. And in the little features that are a bit different, that they're not just standard people. You see the woman with her eye turned slightly inwards. They've got the birthmarks. There's a sense that they're really individuals, even underneath this. They seem to be placid and accepting the system, but underneath there's sadness and individuality. But there's also a sense of all the kind of lines that 
connect them all to each other, the son to the parents, but also all of them to Mal, who still lives on as a button on their, on their, on their uh, uniforms. So yeah, it's kind of about sadness and kind of an inherited sadness, inherited tragedy, um, and the connections between people uh, that can't be spoken of but are there in the history. So I'm not sure whether I should show some more pictures or just open to questions and show pictures as they come up. Questions. So who's going to handle the questions? Am I just going to ask people to ask questions? And how are we going to do it? Yes. So I was being told, or like at least I'm a Kalana queer, or like you know, Jai of June Force was like at first student was kind of like organized, and there's no leader at the first place, so student would just like go around and like spoke about like what they what they feel, like what is lacking in this country. So maybe later on there was some like leadership goes up and what I'm aware of that was in some sense the student was kind of like manipulated to like get something from you know, to benefit the European leadership, right? Um. Yeah, the question of who was manipulating who is, is a really interesting, interesting question. Um, so, so, yeah. I was saying, like, maybe after uh, those, like, uh, events was kind of, like, out of control. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, when, when the demonstrations um, broke out in the spring of 89, yes, the trigger was the death of Hu Yaoban. And the, they took the opportunity to, to go into the streets and, and to express mourning for Hu Yaoba and go to Tiananmen Square to do that, which was a tradition. We'd, we'd seen in 1976, if you know your history, that this had happened before. Um, but it was only the trigger. I mean, there was very much the feeling, as I tried to indicate earlier, that there was something, it was building up to something. There was a sense of frustration, a sense of angst. There had been these demonstrations in late 86 and 87. It was almost like the students were waiting for a pretext to do something big. Certainly in the University of, uh, University of Beijing, um, University of Beida and Tsinghua, because all the way through 1988, uh, sorry, um, yes, 1988, there'd been a sense of like a building, building sense of, of, of that there had to be changed. So Hu Yaobang had lost his position at the start of 87. And then there'd been a kind of period of retrenchment. But then in 88, everything seemed to be booming again. Everything was opening, opening, opening. Um, economically, there was lots of problems. There was inflation rising and so on because there was so much going on in the economy. But at the same time, there was a real sense of, like, of energy that at the top level, at the level of Zhao Ziyang and his think tanks, whose, thi whose thinking was pretty well known and quite well known to the students, that they were really looking at really expanding the political space in China. There was talk he was sending people to Singapore to study Singapore and so on. And in, during the year of 1988, um, there was a documentary shown on um, China Central Television that talked about all the issues in China and, uh, and how they could be resolved by opening up to the West and so on. So there's a sense the students, you know, saw all this and thought, you know, maybe there is a chance that we will have a place, you know, that we will be able to participate in this society. And so they were having salons and discussing all this stuff, discussing what they saw on television, discussing what they heard in the street, and thinking about the ways in which they could participate. And so when they had this opportunity. When Hu Yaobang died, posters went up at Beijing University, Tsinghua and so on, within hours of the news coming through. Posters saying, let's go to Tiananmen Square, let's rally. People were going down there within, I think within hours, they were marching on Tiananmen Square. Thousands of students from Beida and Tsinghua and so on. So there was a great desire to do that. And I don't think, at that stage, I think it was a spontaneous thing coming from these students. Um, You've got to remember the kind of period they were living in. They, they'd seen, they, they were aware of things like people power in the Philippines. I remember when I was there in 86 that students would talk about that. I reported on the demonstrations in 86 and 87 and they would talk about that. They would talk about people power and how people can change things. They would talk about May 68, the revolutions around, that happened around uh, Europe in May 68, which they'd heard about from some of their teachers and the, and the Westerns they were meeting. They had a sense that they could be really change things. And they felt at the top there was sympathy. That was the really key thing. They thought Zhao Ziyang was sympathetic. And they didn't know what Li, Li Pang, who was the um, Premier at the time, they didn't know what his position was. So there was a sense that they could do this stuff. So they, I think that at that stage, 
it's pretty spontaneous. There are, and there very soon some charismatic leaders amongst the students emerge. And initially, they're people who are rather, even though they're quite flamboyant, like Wu Kaishi and so on, they are actually quite sober. They have a sense of like how far they should go with this thing and, and when they should draw back. But then there are other leaders who are more, are more strident. And those are the leaders that, in the end, are the ones who really want to stay in Tiananmen Square to the bitter end. So um, when it comes to the question of manipulation, I think that the only thing that was really manipulating them were themselves. They made bad, the students made a lot of bad decisions in the last, last uh, days. Um, but um, I don't think there's a, the, the, the government later, the Chinese government liked, they made a report that said they were manipulated by foreign forces. That the, they, they blamed the Fulbright Foundation. They blamed, they, literally, they did. There was, a, there was a document that said the Fulbright Foundation had been had plotted to overthrow the Chinese government and it sent teachers specifically, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot of kind of, you know, fifth column, et cetera. But if you look at the range of people who joined the demonstrations at the peak, which included journalists and people's daily, you know, police people, policemen, all sorts of people joined the demonstrations. I think it was a, really a popular movement that in the end made bad decisions. And of course, at the top, there was all sorts of, you know, all that political maneuvering at the top. Um, that led to the crackdown when Jiao Ziyang lost out. But, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Can I just chip in? I, I can't restrain myself. I, was, I, was, uh, I went to Tiananmen Square at the end of the day. Mm. And I was there, I was 21 years old. That was the summer after my junior year of college. And Big party, I was right? was traveling in China, and just by circumstance, I was in Beijing at that time, and I, I left about a week before the shooting to go to Kunming, and then I saw the demonstrations in Kunming, and then from there I was down in Hong Kong, and then the shooting started. Yeah, yeah. And it was incredibly traumatic for me, because I went to this, and to this day I feel very emotional about this, uh, because I, I went down to the square, and I talked to students, and I met people, and you're right, everyone supported the students. And I wanted to point out that, that, that there was chaos on the square, and yet there was order within the chaos. And what really mm. stuck in my memory, for instance, going down there, to get to the square, the streets were all totally clogged. Everybody was supporting the students. All organizations were out. I mean, there were groups of workers and police and everyone you could think of. Army, there, was, there were different divisions. Of exactly. Army, of course, that supported the students. But in this, in the, the gridlock that enveloped the central part of the city, it was very difficult to move. But at this point, the hunger strikers were on the buses, mm. and they were dying, and they yeah. were suffering brain damage, and it was, it was terrible. It was yeah. raining, it was, it was wet, and mm. you knew these people were dying. And I remember seeing these students, this would go on for, I mean, this is probably a quarter, half a mile, yeah. of students keeping lanes open for the ambulance. Yes, and they yes. did this by holding hands. And yeah. I went through that lane. And I went through here, and I saw these young people who are men and women utterly exhausted. Because yeah. they've been doing this yeah. for more than 24 hours, and the only way they could maintain the lanes for the ambulance was by human chains to, to yeah, hold true. their hands so that these cars could get through. Yeah, it was amazing. And, and it was incredibly moving, and there, there was order. And I would say there was no manipulation by us. No, it no. was very clear. Yeah. And, and I talked to a number of students, and these, these are really smart, educated people. Mm, they were. And what struck me at 21 years old is, is I had people come up to me to ask me about the civil rights movement in the United States. Exactly. And the problem I yeah. had is I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> and I had students came up to me, and they said, tell me about Martin Luther King. How did you do it? How yeah. did it work? And they were what totally. I, say? Yeah. I, I didn't know. I didn't, yeah. you know I That's didn't. what I was trying to hint at before when I said I felt like a teenager again when I was there because you know, like you, it was a tutorial in your own culture, yeah, and sure. you realize how little you know. But it's but it's absolutely true. This thing about taking inspiration from um, America and and from yeah, civil rights and other movements around. And Gorjan, who I read the two two um, readings about, he was one of the hunger strikers. You would have seen him in the buses if you walked by. He was one of those guys, and. Um, he, you know, like when he was putting his, you know, they put these headbands on that they had to, like, they put, I like, one one. right, okay, they put the headbands on. And here's one, he said he was trying to work out what to write on it because they could all choose what they wrote. And he said, and then someone said, um, there was something, he said, there was something, it sounded really great, and I said, so that sounded good for me. And I said, what was it? And he was sort of trying to explain to me in Chinese what he was. And I said, said, you mean, it was give me liberty or give me death. And he said, yeah, that's it, that's it. And I thought, yeah, he said, is that a good one? And I said, yeah, I've heard it before. So they were like, they were getting this kind of inspiration. So there was inspiration in that sense. But it was coming from this 80s background that I've tried to describe before, which is that you know, the Western experts are coming, 
And you know, Dung Shopping's idea is they come in and they teach them to you know technical things and business things and bring bring investment and so on. Um, but of course, they have to bring they bring their cassette tapes and they bring their ideas. And of course, there are teachers coming in to teach English and history and other things. And all this other stuff comes in as well, you know. And it's it's everything from you know Salvador Dali and you know um, you know rock music, Michael Jackson. But it's also this stuff, you know. It's Martin Luther King and the events of May and all these other things. And all this is very exciting. And they're young, and it's spring. The other thing I really remember about the time was that the demonstrations that earlier, they started in winter. They were like the right at the end of winter. And I remember we all said to each other at the time, even though they were saying events of May, you know, people power, we were saying, they'll never last past, you know, into winter, you know, like past January 1st, because um, spring festival's coming anyway, they're gonna go home. And secondly, it's gonna be too cold, you know, to hang out in Tiananmen Square. So, but this was spring, as you say. And, and beautiful, and even though it got pretty fetid towards the end, with the rain and the, and the a number of people camped and so on, it was pretty inspiring, I think, up until, until within just a few days of the end, when it got really bad. And people, I mean, people knew something bad was going to happen, but... Well, people knew. You but know, they didn't want to the believe it. And the rivers with the army was surrounding mm. the city, and there, were there was all of that. coming from the provinces. Yeah. And then there was the face-off. Of yeah. Them. So, People knew. I mean, this was, but, you was know, as I said, you know, Gorgian, like he was, you know, he's a student at the time, he was in the hunger strike, he'd been in the army. And he'd had more, he'd had better sources in the army than anyone, he had a sense of the army. And he do, true believed, you know, um, as they used to call the PLA, I think they still do, you know, the, the, the most beloved people of the nation, you know, this way collider in. You know, he, believe, he kind of believed that, and people believed that. They thought they would come, maybe they would uh, try and maintain order, but they would not kill people, they would not shoot. And of course, the first waves of army didn't. They just stalled in the suburbs and just sat there chatting, you know, and taking drinks and icy poles and chatting and you know, singing and whatever. But then they brought in, of course, as you know, the the, the, the proper troops who had an instruction and to clear the square by dawn, and they did it. And they did it, as we know, very brutally in the suburbs, particularly. And that's what the reading was about, because it's it's Deng Xiaoping apparently stated the desire that no blood be spilt in Tiananmen Square. And although there's some dispute about that, um, it's pretty. It seems to be the case from all the records that we've got that no one was killed in the square itself, but they were certainly killed in the in the streets surrounding. And a lot of that was witnessed, of course, by uh, Western media, and even the days following, people were being shot in the streets. So, yeah. But what an extraordinary experience to be there, and terrible, traumatic as well. So. But it still it still bothers me. Why should know that? I, I, have a, I have students, I have many students who take, I teach Japanese literature. Oh, wow. Well. History of Japanese civilization is going to be, and I have students from mainland China who take my courses. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've talked to them about this. And, and you say there's a widespread cynicism, but I find it's just generally people don't know. They, and I find that mm -hmm. really disturbing. I just, I, really I kind of. hearing you read yeah, these accounts because yeah. I, I sometimes feel like. Don't yeah, I, I, I have a kind of, yeah, we should talk about that later. I, I kind of just, I dispute that to some extent. Um, I think that there is, you know, there is some of that. But I also think um, there's a lot of kind of suppressed memory because a lot of these kids that you'd be teaching would have had parents who would have been involved. It's that kind of generational thing. And they'd know a bit about it, even though they might not talk about it. And certainly in Beijing, where of course I've spent most of my time, I've spent... Um, I've been going in and out of China for 30 years, and I've, I've lived most of the time, well, I lived in China, in Beijing, so for almost 12 years, I lived in Beijing on and off. And I have to say that in Beijing, they remember, they remember. And they don't just remember June 4, at the time when the censorship, you know, goes into overdrive and they censor every single, you know, thing that could possibly relate to June 4. Um, not just then, you get into taxis, taxis late at night, and they're chatting to taxi driver, and they say, you know, when do you first come to Beijing? And, you know, if I'm kind of feeling like my, you know, in the mood, I said, oh, well, actually, I first came in the 80s. And then you have the conversation straight away. Were you here in 89? And they will tell you stories. I saw this. I ferried people to hospital. I did whatever. People will talk about it. And as I said before, this thing of saying before 89 and after 89, people say that all the time. And it's even an official discourse. If you look at even official histories of Chinese contemporary art, the ones that are written to be in Chinese to be allowed to be used in China, they do refer to this being a pivotal point. It's just they don't say what actually happened. They often say this, the, the sad events of that year or, or the something, the, the incident, they use the word incident or whatever. So it's not as if it's not there, it's just that they've got a particular interpretation. And of course everyone um, who actually was there or knows someone who was there, and if you talk about a million people in Beijing and how that, they know about it, it's just that, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to talk about it. And maybe the younger ones, they think, well that's, 
that's hero stories from my parents. I don't want to know about what they did in the 1980s. I want to think about what am I going to do in the 2010s or you know, 2020s or something, maybe. I don't know. But that was great. Thank you so much for that contribution. That's great. I, I just add something. I, I also teach here. Oh, right. Japan, I do modern China. I wasn't there until we landed. Um, I teach here at Wayne. Probably fortunately. I was there. It was traumatic. Oh, well, same years as me. Yeah. We probably were um, at the same parties. And I saw those demonstrations. Mm. Mm. They were serious. The yeah, the ice the thing. Yeah. If you read my book, you'll see the whole thing there. Good. I've not met many people who actually were there, so I didn't. I was there. Yeah. We must have met each other. I probably saw you then. <laughs> um, but one of the things is, so I teach um, a lot of people Chinese students, and one of them is Chinese students. So I teach a lot of Chinese students as well. Mm. Um, and um, I find um, that they are most excited when we get to meet. Um, Most not, excited about what? They can't wait till we get to that date. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So there's a, uh, I would say over half of my students now are Chinese. Uh, mm -hmm. Incredible. Um, in the course of eight weeks. Um, and I can just feel the energy changing dramatically yeah. as we approach that period of time. Um, and sometimes people will come and speak with me. I think another thing to say is it's still, first of all, you're, I mean, they're very young. It's, it's before yeah. they were born. Yes, exactly. Well before they were born. Yeah, well before. They were born um, in the 90s. So, I mean, that's, Late 90s. I, I wasn't that aware of things that it took place, you know, 10 or 15 years mm. ago. No. Only in the next few years. But I think, too, there's a cautiousness. Mm. There is a worry. Oh, for um, sure there is. There's only so much people are yeah. going to say. Uh, in yeah, exactly. And so, um, that's for sure. Well. Um, I think people do know. Yeah, so, I think it's interesting. Especially students in the U.S. So. Yeah. I think you're right about the cautiousness, and, and it's, it's funny because sometimes you know, people say, oh, well, no one knows anymore. You often get these reports around June 4, no one's ever heard of it, no one knows about it and stuff. And they often cite this particular thing, which I think is very funny. When a, a, I think an American film crew or documentary crew went down to Beida and a few of the universities one year and they, around June 4 and they, with a picture of Tank Man, you know, the tanks, you know, the man in front of the tanks, and, and they showed it to people and they said, do you know what this is? And, of course, people said, no, I've never said that. But is that, is that Russia? I mean, they said this were clearly stupid, because it's obviously a Chinese person, right? But they pretend they don't know. But they say it quite convincingly, in the way that you know, Chinese people are very good at that. Practicing the culture of evolution is handed down. So they say, yeah, no, I don't, oh, no, I don't. And in this thing, there's like 20 or 30 people that are going, no, 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 kind of thing. And they finally get some guy going, um, yeah, I know what that is, but we're not meant to talk about it. It's the only one guy, right, out of 20, say. I forget how many there was. People say, see, no one knows about it. Here are the, here are the creme de la creme of the nation of Beidar. They don't know about this. People will think only one person knew about it. I'm thinking, no, one person had the guts to say he'd even heard of it. The other 19, maybe there were a few that didn't, genuinely thought it might be Russia, but the others just, just like, are they really going to fess up in front of an American camera crew about what they know about Tiananmen Square? I don't think so. Not when they've worked so hard to get into Beidar. No. So I think... I think in the provinces, again, it might be different, but even that's not true. There's a wonderful um, book, which I still haven't read, but it's been much, much um, um, recommended to me, which I think you probably, both of you would really enjoy, um, or find interesting. It's by a woman called Louisa Lim, who was a yeah, People's Republic of Amnesia. Now, I haven't read it, so I, I shouldn't just state it, but I know she studies the situation in Chengdu, which is, um, which had really sort of important demonstrations during this Tiananmen period. Um, and the demonstrations there were also really bloody put down. And it's very unknown because they weren't really in journals there at the time. But she went and she made a study at that particular place. And I think that would be really fascinating to look at. And so I think I was about to say something rather stupid, which was perhaps out of Beijing, outside of Beijing and Shanghai, people don't really remember. But I think, well, it was happening everywhere. Like you mentioned Kunming. Uh, you always mention, you know, like uh, Gong Ka Gyatso, who's um, another person in my book who's from Tibet. Uh, you know, there were demonstrations in, in Lhasa. So, you know, there was things going on everywhere. And so the, the, the cohort of people who were involved um, is immense. And I think it's interesting that the students are interested to study it. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to move away from Chinese culture and Yeah, good idea. Um, and I wonder if you can reflect a little bit on, and I know this kind of goes beyond the period of your book, I guess, but um, no, my period of the book, the book ends in, um, in 2017, okay, so, 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 actually, yeah, so it ends with this party congress that I couldn't predict. Um, 
really fueled a really huge boom in our market. It did. It did. A lot of money. Uh, yeah. A lot of people getting very, very rich. Um, and at the same time, you have, uh, in places like Beijing, you have art villages cropping up and then getting bulldozed Absolutely. and cropping up. And so yep. there's, there's a tremendous amount of precariousness still among kind of independent creative yeah, producers. Yeah, absolutely. And you also have this, this huge art market fueled by the galleries in Chichoba and mm -hmm, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious to hear kind of your thoughts about where the, how, what kind of platform um, 1989 put China's art market on and what some of the challenges well, of course, this, today. this, yeah. And then, and then the, only, the only other thing I wanted to hear your thoughts about was the current show at the Guggenheim. Ah, yeah, and, sure. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we can get into all the politics that have been going on around that, but I'm curious about how you see that show as an outcome of the kind of yeah. Okay, so um, in terms of the art market, as, you, as I'm sure you know, because because of your question, that the art market, uh, well, certainly in the, it didn't exist in the 1980s, of course. In the 1990s, it basically didn't exist either. We're talking, even though there there are these shows being made, the one that I referred to that, that had the, the you know the Feng Jun etc. in it, um, in the early 1990s, it was curated by Johnson Chang in Hong Kong and Li Xianting. Um, there wasn't an art market then either. They sent this exhibition around the world and it, it created a, um, a lot of interest. It was a museum show. People were fascinated by it. People went and said, oh, you know, there's something really going on in China still. This is really fascinating. But it did not fuel any kind of boom. Johnson Chang, the works came back and he put them in the warehouse. You know, no one bought anything. They try, they, it was a museum show at first and then they sent it to London, I think, to Marlborough Gallery and they did in fact try and sell something. No one bought anything. They thought it was interesting, but there was no sense of like Chinese contemporary is the next coming thing. People, no, nah, not at all. Um, so through the 1990s, there are some there are some collectors and there are people um, people like you know Julie and me and so on who are coming and going and they're helping the artists to find some museums who might buy their work and so on. This is happening, but market real market nothing. No gar art galleries, of course, either. The first contemporary art gallery that was based in the mainland doesn't happen until. Brian's gallery, which has just had his 20th anniversary, so that's 2000. 2000. So you don't, until the early 2000s, oh, you don't yeah, get. Sorry, 1991. 1991, sorry. Yes. You don't, he's the first contemporary art gallery that's on the mainland, but, but he's not really doing any business. Most of the time, it's a private, it's yes, a private it's thing. A private, like, yeah. you know, it, but he's the only one, there's no others. So when the market really starts to pick up, is, there are a couple of things. One is that the Venice Biennale focuses on China at the, in the late 1990s, and um, Johnson Chang um, enlists um, a friend um, whose name now escapes me, but the friend knows Princess Diana. He gets Princess Diana to come to this pavilion that they kind of curate, full of Chinese contemporary art. David Tang. David Tang. He just died recently. Um, that creates a lot of photos. And as I say, there are a couple of collectors who are collecting at the time. Uli, Uli Sieg, who you've probably heard of, um, this, uh, the uh, Swiss collector. He's collecting, and the others are the Ullens, Ullens family who opened the Ullen Centre in 798. So they're collecting, but other than that, there's not really collectors, and there are no galleries really interested. But in the late 1990s, things start to pick up, and it's in the early 2000s, so it's very late. You're talking about 2003, I think, when the first work of Chinese contemporary art goes above a million. And it's, it's Feng Li Jun, the guy, the yawning guy, it's one of his works. It sells in London for 500,000 pounds. And that's, like, that's late, so it's 2000s already. So there's already been like a whole decade of, of curatorial interest and museum interest and, and, and the artists are going overseas, a lot of them going overseas after Tiananmen and later in the 90s and so on. There's a lot of interest about them. People are curating shows, Julie, people like her are curating shows in America and elsewhere. But people aren't buying the stuff at all. They really start buying it in the 2000s, early 2000s, and then it builds up to that massive and kind of obscene boom around the time of the Olympics. When the prices just go you know, to ridiculous heights. And people, you know, collectors and galleries, all the galleries are opening, Pace, Pace Gallery opens, I think, in 2008 in Beijing. All these galleries come, and collectors turn up, and grifters and all sorts of awful people, and they, they descend on the, um, the students who are still doing their graduation shows, and they buy up the whole show, and they do this stuff, and they buy everything. And that's, you know, like you start to see the market really developing. And then, of course, post-2009, the global financial crisis, all of that hot money that's coming from the West is sucked out of the system because of the crash in the, in the West. But then, of course, the Chinese money starts coming in. And at first, they buy traditional art, and they buy, they buy Chinese modern art, they buy things, they don't buy contemporary. 
But then at a certain point, they start buying contemporary. That's over the last couple of years, really, three or four years. And they put another ceiling onto the, onto the market. So today, the market's really interesting. In the mid-2000s, 70%, more than 70% of Chinese contemporary art was bought by Westerners, and only about 30% by, by Chinese, mainland Chinese. Now it's the reverse. So there are major Chinese collectors, young and old and rich and relatively not so rich, buying Chinese contemporary art. And that puts an amazing kind of you know, floor under the, to the thing and supports it. And so the Chinese artists of today, they have a, a very interesting situation where they can have a good career in China, if they happen to be appealing to that market. They can have a parallel career in the West, if, they work, if their work somehow works better there, or they can have the two together. And Sal Fei, who is slide I just put up here, kind of almost in anticipation of your question, she's a wonderful artist, uh, born in 1978 um, in Guangzhou. Her work is you know, really beautiful, I won't go into it now. She starts doing her work in the early 2000s. She has parallel careers now. She, her work is mostly it's in video and um, on the internet, she just work in Second Life. Um, she has photographic work and performance and all sorts of different things. She creates, she used to until quite recently, create exactly the same work for China as she did for the West. For a Western gallery and a Chinese gallery, it was the same work. But now under the pressure of censorship, she's now producing a kind of a bolt, you know, kind of an amended version for China and a, a more extensive one for the West. And even recently she started to think, well, that's, I don't want to do that even, that's just stupid and fake. And she's actually trying to create work in China that's so kind of elusive and playful and off point that the Chinese won't understand that it's uh, as subversive as it is. So um, that's a long way of answering your first question. Now, um, so there's a market and it's like much different than it was. And the second thing is Guggenheim show. Well, that's big, a big issue. Um, if you get a chance to go to New York, um, I would urge people to go and see it. Um, because it does um, try to focus on artists who have not received as much attention as some of the ones I've been showing. So if you look at Feng Li Jun and uh, Zhang Xiaogang and so on, the painters, who I do believe are the great artists of the 90s, they don't focus on them. They focus on more on um, the artists who were working in performance um, and video art, uh, the start of the video art scene and so on. And these were guys who who congregated, they were uh, congregated in um, artist villages like you referred to, um, um, specifically the East Village of Beijing, named for the East Village of, um, of New York, um, and inspired to some extent by the experience of Ai Weiwei, who left China in the early 80s and came back in the mid-90s. And he was involved in kind of, you know, stimulating a kind of another art group in China that was not painters, they were doing other kinds of work, often quite extreme, you know, Zhang Huan, the great performance artist of the time, hanging from the ceiling with blood dripping out of his arm onto a, onto a hot plate to express the sense of, you know, well, it was about Tiananmen as well, everything's about Tiananmen in a way, but they're doing it in a different way. So the Guggenheim show, I think, is interesting. I'm sorry they got themselves into that total schmozzle around the animal art. They should have known better, really seriously, to have put Theatre of the World as their main piece. People will know this is the one with the insects. And, the yeah, lizards and things. Really yeah, well, that's right. The yeah. thing was that as soon as they had the New York New York Times article, they they had the, they talked about the dog video, right? And I think people thought the dog video was going to be the dogs were going to be in the gallery, right. you know, and they were going to be on treadmills and they were going to be attacking each other. Now it is a horrible work; it's disgusting, and uh, I have to say that Peng Yu and Sun Yuan do do a lot of really disgusting work. Less so recently, but they certainly in the early two thousands they made horrible work. That video really should never have been made, and it probably shouldn't have been put in the collection. Um, of the exhibition, um, given you know where people are now with the idea of how you use animals in art, but yeah, the whole thing became a f perfect storm. But I think Guggenheim, they should have known it was coming. They had the, they they briefed the New York Times. They'd done this huge feature. It was within hours of that that the petition started. They didn't seem to have any kind of social media strategy. It was kind of like oh, you know, the exhibitions are meant to be subversive. They're meant to be controversial. Well, yes, but you know, have a have an argument for it. Explain why the dog thing needs to be there. There is a way of explaining why it should be there. It represents a certain tendency, a certain brutality. The whole show, in a way, is trying to show the brutality of 89 to 2009. You know, Tenement Square, fall of the Berlin Wall, to Olympics and the global financial crisis. That's meant to be their thing. But when you go there, you'll find that they, they cheat all the time. They put a lot of stuff in before 89 because it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of great stuff in the early 80s earlier in the 80s, and they put stuff in later as well. So it's, um, it's a really interesting show. It's really stimulating. You'll see some really, I think, fascinating work. The video work is very strong. 
the stuff by Jung, the Jung Pei Lee work is, it, you know, I, I never, I can, I can see it many times, I never see it often, but even though it's very simple, it's fascinating work. Um, there's work by South A, there's lots of, uh, there's good work by Ai Weiwei. Um, so yeah, it's a good show, but I think the Guggenheim should have really thought through there. The curatorial concept a bit better, they should have thought, why are we putting the animals in and how are we going to defend it? Because it was kind of indefensible by the time they had to defend it. And you wanted to ask a question. Then. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I, did, I teach Chinese art history at CU Denver. Uh, I really love the really poetic way that you narrated this history. So, so it's ever, yeah. So uh, I was, you know, it's funny. I was talking about their like '89 experience. I was a seven-year-old in Xi'an. So oh wow. Well. <laughs> did you watch? Well, I you didn't see it on, on, on television. There was some. I'm um, not watching my television. Oh, I knew something was terrible going on. Something really traumatizing to the adults around me. But at the same time, my father was preparing to come to the United States. And oh, he left right. On June 4, 1989. Oh, really? Flew out that day? On that very day, because the situation was becoming increasingly tense. And he knew that wow. his visa he had And this is in Xi'an, did you say? Xi'an. So wow. that day, um, the flight was from, yep, rerouted to Hong Kong. We were supposed to leave from Beijing, but the airport was shut down. So Xi'an oh. to Hong Kong to the United States. How amazing. Right. So, <laughs> that anyhow, is really, that's so really, he, that's, he, I mean, that's sort of in some ways replaced by my family's history and that in this this is like the other a more sort of personal moment for for us yeah. rather than this political moment. I think it's but, really interesting. Yeah, but um I guess I, I So really you were born in nineteen what, nineteen eighty something. Sorry? Wait, so you were seven do you say I you were seven? Nineteen eighty two. Yeah. yeah. So you and this girl would have quite a lot in common because she remembers as a young girl hearing it, seeing it on television, and, really? and and that yeah, her older sister was kind of like you know agitated about it, and her parents were listening to the radio and watching it. Well, um, I thought, yeah, yeah. to talk more about this, I, I remember a, a major art history and an undergrad, and did my chose to write one of my papers on the goddess of, of um, oh, democracy statue, yeah, yeah, and this was like early days of internet. I, I Google these terms right, mm, and mm. then flooded images. Yeah, just came, comments, and yeah. I, I cried like in my dorm room. Yeah. The imagery is really minutes. powerful, really powerful. Right. I did a talk earlier today in um, Denver University, and we talked about the power of imagery and how, and we talked about this whole thing about the, the way the censorship, you know, tries to you know suppress any knowledge of the, the events of June four, and and they can they can censor, you know, they keep censoring every word and term and so on, but they find it really hard to suppress imagery. And images can be really powerfully embedded into the culture. And well, actually, yeah. my real question actually was, oh, um, right. you, from your perspective as a journalist, do you think artists are uniquely qualified to articulate this history? Is yes. Is that why you chose to focus on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, that is what, yeah, yes, I do. And yes, yes, so I do think that that's why, that is why I did. Um, I, I've been thinking, I was thinking about writing this book for quite a long time, and I, I wanted to. I wanted to write a book. It was partly inspired by the fact that I'd spent so much time in China, and and every time I'd go home to Australia and to visit my family or whatever friends, they would say, "Why do you keep going? Like, why do you keep going back to that country? You know, like why is it? You know, why is it so interesting? Why do you find it so fascinating? Why don't you move back to Australia? You know?" And I think, how can I explain to them that like it's the most ex extraordinary place on earth? You know, and the and the history I've already had the privilege of witnessing is so epoch making. You know, when you talk about when I first started talking and I said, you know, I was covering what was like, seemed to me like a supercharged version of the Industrial Revolution, it was like that. It is like that. You know, things that have took a hundred years in the West to play out. In China, they happened within 10 years. And so I arrived in 86, but then as soon as I arrived, I started to look back, at, you know, set from 78 on and think about how it started with Deng Xiaoping and so on, and then started thinking about democracy wars. So I started to think about all these things from the moment I arrived in 86. And then through the 90s, I kept thinking, there's so much going on, so much going on. I kept going back. And then I went back to live in 2004 and didn't finally leave till I had to come home to write the book. But in that time, I thought, the trouble is with trying to write a book that would convince my friends and relations there was a reason why I was still staying in China, that it was really fascinating. I didn't want to write it in st of the kind of the, the way that as a journalist I've been trained to do when I first went there was a kind of economics report. I didn't want to talk, you know, statistics, you know, and stuff. The statistics are amazing, but everyone knows them. And they're just like you hear them and they're just I thought the really interesting thing is what 
the emotional history of the time. Like, what's it been like for people to live through this incredible period? What's it like for someone like, you know, Huang Rei, who was, you know, in the Cultural Revolution and then, you know, in the 1970s, there at the start of this big story. What's it like for someone like that to go through that and then Tiananmen and then go through to today and to be a kind of, you know, a person in their 60s looking at China today? What's it like for them? Um, and as I started to think about that, I suddenly realised that the solution of how to do it was, was hiding in plain sight, which was that when I moved back to China in 2004, I was determined not to work as a political economic journalist anymore because I knew from my experience in the 80s and the 90s that this not only got myself into a lot of trouble, it got my friends into trouble. You'd be followed and harassed and there were always difficulties. I thought, I'll come back to China and I'll find jobs that will not get me into trouble and will allow me to have a normal life in China, just enjoying being in China. So I initially worked for the China Radio International, propaganda ministry, that worked well. Then I worked as an art reporter. And I worked as an art reporter because I'd been interested in art since I met that guy at the party I described in the book. And I kept up with them over the years. And I suddenly realised, this is the way to tell the story. All these guys, all these artists I've been keeping up with, and all the new ones I've been meeting, the younger ones, up until the ones who are like millennials, they interact with the history in all sorts of incredible ways. Their work is all, it commentates and expresses and it, it maps the mood of the nation in the most extraordinary way. And if I could put the right group of people together, if I could choose the right artists, from all different parts of China, different age groups, um, different backgrounds and experiences, I can build up an emotional picture of the history from like, post-cultural revolution to today, told through their lives, but also told through what they saw, actually, and how they expressed it. And of course, in that early period, there are artists who are directly involved in history, like Guo Jian, who's a, who got, he's like a kind of zealot, you know, kind of uh, Forrest Gump, you know. He, he appears everywhere, like he's in the army and like in 1979, he's like in the, in, the, in the war that China has with Vietnam, you know, which is like not, you know, kind of thing. And then he's kind of in China, in Beijing at the sort of avant-garde in the 80s, and then he's in, he's in Tiananmen Square as a hunger striker, and then later, I mean, like it's just, it's kind of like a joke, really. So he's, he's realised these people can really tell the story. So, yeah, that's how I decided, I decided to do it. And so... Um, yeah, and I was pleased that I did, and I think it really does work. And like when I finished it, I thought to myself, did it actually work? And I thought, yeah, it does work. And just to give you an idea of the kind of contrast, so here we go, like okay, South, you know, the kind of, you can, you know, if you read the book, you'll see, you know, what the, what the sort of reforms of the 90s look like from the South, if you were a teenager. But, but look how they look up in the North. You know, like, I chose two artists who were born, in, born at the start of the period, so Deng Xiaoping generation, born in 78 and 79. Salfei and Jiali, Jiali coming from far northeast of China, um, Salfei coming from Guangzhou, and their experience of the nights was totally different. You know, in the south it was like, oh, you know, Guangzhou's booming, we're rising, we're going to be like Hong Kong, it's exciting, factory of the world, you know, economic juggernaut. In the north it was like, oh, once we were the kind of workers aristocracy, you know, there were the people that, you know, the big factories creating planes and machinery, and it was all wonderful. And then in one day in Xinjiang, where Jiali studied, did art, in just one day, one million people lost their jobs in Xinjiang alone when they reformed the state-owned enterprises. Millions of people across the province, um, across the northeast. And so you see the difference in experience, and that's the kind of thing you do with art. You know, you can take two people from different parts of China, and because they're artists, the way they talk about their experience is very visual. They give you wonderful material to work with, to, to, to interchange with the kind of statistics and stuff. But the art is so expressive. You know? You could talk for hours about the difference in the North and the South in that period, but you just show those two images and it's all there. So yeah, I definitely think it's a, they're peculiarly qualified to understand what's going on in their culture because they're visual people and they look. Their whole job is to see things clearly. And I think in China they have a particular idea of the role of the artist, which is rather different to the West. They do see themselves having responsibility. Even when they say, oh, it's art for art's sake, I don't care about politics and so on. They, don't, they mean they don't care about politics in the kind of ghastly sort of big P way, but they totally care about what's happening in their society and around them. And they constantly make work that commentates on it. And, and they're the intellectuals. They are. They're the kind of, you know, they're the... the you know, the avant-garde in China is a really important force, and it's not just, it's writers, of course, and so on as well. Um, but, you know, they're the guys, you know, and I really do believe that, as I said at the start, that, you know, d China was changed. You know, Deng Xiaoping, you know, the things that he did were extraordinary, but they would never have worked. If they just sat there in Zhongnanhai and said, okay, reform and opening up, 
If it hadn't been for the fact that out there in the countryside the peasants were already doing it and they wanted to do it, they wanted to farm themselves again. They weren't for people in the streets who really wanted to change society, who wanted to take on the chance of you know, coming up with the good ideas and so on, but also starting private enterprise and stuff. It wasn't for that kind of energy of Chinese people and their creativity. Nothing would have happened. They would have been sitting around sloganeering for years and years and years and nothing would have happened. And I think the interchange between the two things, you know, pushing from below and, above, and coming from above. And I think particularly now, the avant-garde is also, also important in China because they're the ones who continue to push for change, even under the most adverse circumstances. And you keep seeing these people coming up. Um, and it's inspiring, and it makes China an inspiring place. And optimistic in the end, but I'm optimistic about it in the end because of that. Yeah. Hello. You speak of the great compromise with the you know, rise of consumerism and materialism in, uh, in lieu of uh, political individualism. How does that play out in uh, the art world at this point? Sorry, in the what world? How in the art world at this point? Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's an interesting... Is it or is it just something that's mm. part of society? It's, it's an interesting point. I, I think... Contemporary artists is an interesting, it's an interesting, interesting position actually because of this thing I talked about before about how there was no market in the 80s and the 90s. They were kind of, to some extent, um, they, were, they kind of stood outside this whole kind of concept of the grand bargain. They had their own bargain which was they would, they would you know, take no notice of the government and they hoped the government would take no notice of them which basically worked for, you know, for a long time. Um, when the government really, the government would take notice of them occasionally when they, they got a bit too kind of obvious. So, when they, after Tiananmen, they, they started gathering in the old summer palace, you were talking about artist villages, in the ruins of the old summer palace, a whole lot of artists went and started living there. And they attracted some attention. You know, curators came and people came, and, and even TV crews, in my case, I shot a story there myself, people came and they filmed them. And they thought, okay, well, with these scruffy artists, you know, we don't care about them most of the time, but they, we don't want them attracting attention, we'll move them on. So they would move them on somewhere else, and, and they would go other places, and they would end up in the East Village, for example, like I talked about before. And they mostly would just ignore them until they did something stupid, like, or well, stupid in their eyes, like, you know, dressing, you know, not dressing up, getting in the nude and doing some kind of performance or something, and they have to arrest them. So, but basically, they thought of them as scruffy, you know, hopers, and they just kind of hoodlins, hooligans in Chinese parlance, and, um, you know, just ignore them, and they just will go away eventually. And of course, a lot of them went away to other countries and had their art careers elsewhere. So the kind of bargain was, you know, there was no bargain really, they didn't make a bargain. Um, so the artists could just go ahead and do what they wanted to do, um, either in continuing China, the ones who stayed in China to create art there, or the ones who left, they really did what they wanted to do, without the really much encouragement from market. So that was good for them, particularly in China, it meant they could do exactly what they wanted. The Chinese government started taking notice when these big prices started being paid. And then it was, kind of, it was kind of an ironic situation for them because um, the Chinese regime is really interested in soft power. They love the idea of, of having things which are as, as attractive to the West as, um, you know, K-pop, you know, Korean pop music or um, Bollywood, you know. And there's, and there's endless, you know, ink that's, you know, spilt talking about, you know, why is it we don't have this kind of thing. And I remember when Kung Fu Panda came out, you know, which you know is a Hollywood film, the Chinese, there was lots of debate. Why can't we create Kung Fu Panda? It's not fair that Americans have made this. And, you know, we've got all these crazy people and they don't create anything that's really good and, you know, is popular. And Anyway, so no one went out to them. The obvious thing, which is the censorship regime is so ghastly that it's really hard for people to actually produce anything that's good because they'll bring in someone from the censorship people to, to destroy the script and make it about, you know, brave, you know, soldiers and peasants and, you know. You know. So it becomes boring. Anyway. So the Chinese contemporary thing is hard for them because, you know, they're making all this money, you know, and it's so it's glamorous. And so I think at that point in the 2000s, you see kind of do you start seeing a bargain being struck. And you see it particularly at the time when 798, which people who've been to Beijing will know, which is the big art district in Beijing, was under threat. So 798 was, was it used to be military factories. And um, in the late 1980s, the military, all the military factory production was moved out of Beijing um, it was a policy to do that, and these buildings, which were built in the 50s, which were incredibly beautiful, built by East German architects, Bauhaus style, gorgeous with the sort of sawtooth roofs, fabulous natural light and stuff, empty. You know, all the factories went away and they were empty. And some people from the Chinese Academy of Fine Arts, who had just been moved nearby in the late um, 1990s, saw this and thought, these are great, and they started moving in. 
So they created a kind of artist thing. And that was kind of allowed to continue because the people who owned the factory thought, OK, these can pay minimal rents and we don't have any money yet to, go, you know, to do anything with the site. Anyway, by about the early 2000s, they realised they could um, get rid of the artists and they could develop these things as condominiums and make a lot of money. But at the same time this was happening, the artists were suddenly getting all this money at auction. And what happened was the artists said, no, no, what you should do is keep, keep this site. Don't let the people who own the site, who was the military in fact, don't let them move us out and make it into condominiums. Make it into an art district, protect it, and when 2008 comes around, the Olympics, which of course have been already awarded by the time these prices are paid, it'll be a fantastic cultural site of Beijing. Soft power. They spoke the language of the government, they thought, oh, fantastic. And so 798 was protected, and it's still the protected zone as they bulldoze everything else around it. 798 still maintains this kind of position. And so there is a kind of a bargain. It's sort of like, if you can make us look glamorous and like we're not completely controlling everything because you do occasionally do work that's subversive, maybe not in China but outside, um, then we'll let you keep on having your beautiful studio spaces and so on and we won't start making you go to political meetings too often. That being said, Xi Jinping did call to get a lot of artists um, not very long into his um, presidency and gave them a lecture about needing to have um, a more positive attitude and to, um, that artists should um, express positive energy and that they were really concentrating too much on negative things and it would be good if they could just, you know, um, take a leaf out of Mao's, you know, book and they could be, you know, a bit more uplifting. And they all sat there and there's, there's footage of them all sitting there going, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. And you can be absolutely sure they walked out of the room going, and not, I don't know if any of them ever actually went and did any positive energy works after that. So they have power because they are um, glamorous and they make money and they um, burnish an image of China. And also they can always leave now. You know, it's an international system now. You know, all, you know, any young artist who's got any real talent now probably has a Western gallery or at least access to it. They've probably studied overseas, they've spent time overseas. So it's a really interesting situation. They haven't had to make the same bargain. And that's why when people say to me, oh, Chinese contemporary art's all been created for the West or they're just making for a market or whatever, it's just rubbish. It's just not true. I think Chinese artists are probably, this might be overstating, but I think in some ways they've been the most freest artists in the world in the last 30 years because they've really just done what they wanted to do, and they still do. It's really quite remarkable. And that's the, I think that's the end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that really excellent questions. Thank you so much and for sharing.